This is a big deal. This movie, this is big. Will I be invited on another movie set from beginning to end? I doubt it. I probably should have tried to talk about him making the movie, but it had Tom Hanks in it. He is, uh, I, I think, the most headstrong director I have ever worked with. Sometimes I think the more money they have, the more stuff it can get. It makes me sad that it was such a fail. The plot thickens, the devil's candy. It was the most famous book in the world. So it had all the ingredients to make a great movie. The epic story behind what went wrong on the bonfire of the vanities. Hosted by Ben Mankiewicz and author Julie Solomon. Listen for free on Apple Podcasts and visit TCM.com slash podcast to learn more. Hi, everyone. Hi, Julie and Ben. Uh, we're Hi. excited to have everyone here. And I know that... Uh, Jeffrey had a question. He had his hand raised right at the beginning. So, uh, Jeffrey, I will go ahead and call on you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julie. Good morning, Ben. How you doing? Good to see you again. Uh, good to see you too. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Uh, well, Ben, my first question is to you. You know, the first season garnered more than a million downloads. I just want to know: Are you just pleased with how the series began? Yeah, of course, very pleased. It was first of all, it was uh, rewarding to help construct um you know I, i'd had i'd wanted to do a podcast uh for some time and i'd been nagging them and even suggested peter but uh, my idea was entirely different and um well i had suggested peter for things on the channel not for the podcast so i'd been talking about i thought we should use peter more and i wanted to do a podcast but my idea for using peter more wasn't as good as this and my podcast idea was just dumb and so the <laughs> Like they, they're, you know, you, you got with real uh, uh, storytellers and, uh, and, and I loved working with uh, Angela and uh, Joanne and Susan and the entire team. And it was just, it was really satisfying. And it was really interesting to be able to talk to somebody like that, you know, five, six sessions, two hours each with Peter. I thought that was rewarding too. And I like Peter very much. So I like telling that story. And obviously we're definitely pleased with the reaction. It set a high bar. Excellent. Thank you. Great, John from the Hollywood Soapbox, your turn. Hi, thank you for the time today. Um, Julie, I was just was wondering if you could kind of relay the news of how you actually got so embedded in the, in the production of this movie. Um, uh, it would seem like it's an opportunity that filmmakers and production companies are not gonna allow any more that close of attention. So um, my luck was Brian De Palma. You know, I think we had become friendly uh, through, I was working as a film critic back then. We'd met, we'd meet from time to time when he was in New York to talk about movies. And I had told him that I was interested in doing this kind of a book, similar to what Lillian Ross had done with Picture many years before in the 50s, following John Huston around. And when he, um, when he signed on to do Bonfire, he thought that might be a good movie to do it on. And, you know, he was a little bit of a bomb thrower. He kind of liked to rustle feathers in Hollywood. And I guess he thought I would be the person to do it. You know, obviously I think he might've thought differently about it if he'd known how the movie was gonna end up. Um, but without him, it wouldn't have happened. Can I, I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna jump in with something that I have not, I know nothing about except for the part of your question about whether it will discourage others, you know, the Julie's unbelievable access. And then let's not, she didn't just have access, it's, it's what she did with the access. Like other people have had access and then, you know, bungled it or created something ordinary. Um, so, I mean, part of the reason that we talk about this movie is because of what Julie did with it. And I'm not just trying to, she already likes me, um, I think. So, um, uh, but, but I think that's really critically important. And I think it's also like if the, if the lesson that, that Hollywood uh, directors and producers take away from the devil's candy is that, oh, we can't grant access like that, they're missing the point. Then this would just be a blockbuster movie that, that disappointed. 
Um, now there's an interesting story around it. And, you know, as long as you have assurances that, uh, you know, that, that during production, the, the little things that might get uh, clicks on Twitter won't be used, right? That this is for a book for something substantive afterwards. I, I think the lesson ought to be that, that it ought to happen more. Um, you know, I, I, oh, so, and I'll tell Julie this, I'll tell you guys as I tell it. So I had a little family event. My niece uh, graduated from high school and uh, my cousin, who is a, 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 a not insignificant producer at a very significant studio now. Um, and uh, if she runs the studio, what am I talking about producer? And she, uh, she said to me that she thinks, Julie, that she, she gives every single person in the business who she meets new, she's 40, um, the devil's candy. And she said, no lie. She goes, I've probably given a hundred copies. I bought a hundred copies and given it to people. And I was like, okay, you're exaggerating. She goes, all right, if I'm exaggerating, I've given 85, but it might be 110. She goes, I, that's what I give people. That's what they should read if they want to lose, uh, use work in this business. And again, as I say, she has uh, succeeded uh, enormously in this business. Oh, thank you for saying that, Ben. I mean, I have to say that for me, it was about, I mean, obviously there are gossipy elements to it, but for me, it was just, I love seeing how things work and the organism and making a movie is just such a huge, complicated enterprise and to have access to all of it. And the truth is I was as interested in, you know, the sound guy that used coconuts to make the sound of horses hoofs going as the movie stars. It was just riveting to me. Thank you. Uh, Mike from the Video Attic, you're up next. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, my question is for Julie. Um, if you were to cast Bonfires, uh, who would be the lead um, for, you, for you if you would cast it? Well, probably at the time, my choice would have been somebody like William Hurt. I mean, he's just sort of what you think about. I don't think Tom Hanks was ultimately a bad choice. It's just people brought so much baggage to it. Um, because I think William Hurt was sort of what you would classically think of as somebody in that position. Um, but the truth is, if you go on a trading floor of bond traders, there are more as many people who look like Tom Hanks <laughs> as William Hurt. Um, but, but the six, there's the ones who've succeeded to the point that Sherman had look more like William Hurt, don't they? I mean, that was sort of the idea to me that maybe Hanks was a little young for that part well yes and no because it's a young man's business it's like the movie business people burn out so um but i think you're right ben in that i think part of this is what your imagination of that kind of person right. is and bill hurt definitely was that person and peter fallow probably was definitely not going to be bruce willis in anybody's imagination <laughs> um you know, I think when they decide to go with an American, somebody like Jack Nicholson or who had that kind of waggish but sneaky intelligence, I think would have been a lot more interesting. And I actually thought Melanie was, I, I thought she did a great job actually as Maria. I, I mean, I think you could buy her as the devil's candy. Totally. Thank you, Cammie from The Classic Couple. Great, thank you. Uh, this is for Judy, um, and uh, I, I want to make sure I get this right, but in the 2002 edition of your book, you have your afterward, right, in which you recap the 10 years after lunch with Brian De Palma, and you quote him as saying, maybe 20, 30 years later, I'll be able to look upon it like an old photograph, but not yet. <laughs> And so now it's that 30 year mark, right? Um, my understanding, Brian is aware of this project, but uh, doesn't really want to revisit the film. So if you will indulge me, I have two questions. So from what you know of Brian De Palma, uh, do you think the bonfire of the vanities will ever become that old photograph that he will reminisce about? And then sort of two parts, just kind of what is your vantage point now reflecting on this work at 30 years. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so honestly, I think 
it will never be easy for him to look back at this movie. And unfortunately, I think the reason is because of the devil's candy. You know, I think that had it just been another movie that didn't work, I mean, Brian's whole career has been up and down and he'd be the first person to say that. But this one became a particular down because of my book. And believe me, for me, that's been an agony because I really respect him and like him so much. And yet this thing that I'm also very proud of, which is my book, is the thing that's like this perpetual thorn in his side. Uh, having said that, when I told him about the podcast, he was excited about it. He he loved the first season of Block Thickens. And, um, you know, I just think it's hard for him. Uh, so I don't know, maybe a 50 years, but <laughs> if that, that, you know, when he's very old, but not, not yet. Um, and the second question, what's the second question again? Sorry. Just a little of your vantage point, ah. uh, reflecting at 30 years. So reflecting at 30 years is incredibly strange for me. So that baby that I had right at the beginning, <laughs> luckily was not scarred by my negligent motherhood that first year. I really wasn't negligent, but um, it was an interesting first year is now 31 and about to get married. So um, that's sort of a different vantage point for me. Uh, but looking back at the film and what happened while it was being made, um, you know, I think if anybody's worked in any kind of an organization, nothing there should surprise anyone about the kinds of conversations people have, the way people make decisions, um, the ups and downs of the intensity of that project. And looking back on it, I think I feel more compassion for everybody, including myself, <laughs> about how crazy the whole thing was, but also I feel incredibly, um, Natalia, my, who's the co-producer on this project, hates the word um, poignant, but there is a kind of poignancy to it and certainly nostalgia for me to hear all the, you know, to see Tom Hanks as a, I don't know, 33 or 34 year old and uh, Melanie Griffith as a young woman going through these kinds of, um, you know, struggle professionally, privately, there's something really incredible to me about it. So, and to hear their voices on those tapes, which, you know, I had no idea I even had. It's, it's just been a remarkable experience. Uh, to look back on it, but you know, I, I I feel good about it to be honest. You know, and that's a nice feeling because sometimes you don't. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Okay, Jim from Real Talker. Hey Ben, I got a question for you. Um, how did this whole uh, season? Why was it this story that you ultimately decided on to tell for this season? What went into it? What was sort of the process? Because someone for like, I wasn't even aware of the movie. <laughs> you know, I'm in my uh, th early 30s in a sense, and I just didn't know about it until I started researching about it. So there's a whole generation of us, especially on a younger side a bit, that doesn't even know about this movie with these major stars uh kind of went hidden for us maybe um but what about this story that really as opposed to probably you had so many other choices what made this the definitive choice to tell this story and come together with julie on this um was there another choice that was close up to do or was this something you just wanted to do from the start so just wanted to hear kind of on the process of selecting this for season two uh, there were no uh, other choices. There were no other stories to tell in Hollywood. We were out of stories to tell. <laughs> the, uh, um, no, uh, the, the, you, you answered the question in, in asking it. And it, it was really the, it was not, uh, we, we weren't thinking, oh, our, after we've done, certainly after we completed, uh, uh, I'm still Peter Bogdanovich, the, our first season, we, we didn't think, you know, let's do, uh, uh, let's find a giant box office failure that's uh, where it's richly told or a success. We, it was this opportunity that developed to partner uh, with Julie, with Campside Media, with Natalia. It was an opportunity to, to, to tell a story that, that we can't, you know, we, our, 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 our genius is just recognizing an opportunity. 
you know, uh, Julie wanted to tell this story at the same time. She had these tapes from her interviews, these recordings of her for interviews uh, for for the for the book. And and then we were, again, smart enough to recognize, wait a minute, this is probably something that we shouldn't pass up. And I'm grateful for their interest in, in partnering with us. And, and for us, it was a pretty easy decision. Uh, the idea of the plot thickens is that we're going to tell uh, compelling Hollywood stories. I mean, that's, you know, uh, that was... I mean, anybody who's a storyteller wants to tell compelling stories. So, you know, we think we we did we found that with Peter that we thought that sort of career arc, which is marked by some failure, right? Which is this really talented filmmaker, one of the seminal filmmakers of the era, along with Brian. Um, and then, you know, he's got failure and he has some arrogance and he has tragedy and he has his own interesting brand of humility about it now too. And that's what I thought made it a compelling story. So. And, and here's, again, the story about a failure, but it's not about failures. It's about a really interesting artistic failure. In some degrees, it's a failure. Of course, it's a success in other degrees. It's that, you know, I mean, it's people's jobs and they created a piece of art and here we are 30 years later talking about it. So, but I love the idea of failure. So I'm trying not to use that word uh, as pejoratively as it, as it sounds. Like I, to me, I, I, I want to, shake Brian. I'm sure he's very eager to be shaken by me um, and say, no, man, like, don't like <laughs> you should be talking about it. You should be talking to Julie about it. And me, I would hope uh, I would love to be there. I'd love to interview the two of them together for a long time. But the, because like what makes Carrie interesting, what makes the untouchables interesting, what makes casualties of war interesting, what makes blowout interesting, uh, what makes rest to kill interesting, even more interesting is that there's bonfire, right? And there are others. Like that's what makes Brian interesting is his the the how something with as talented and as visionary as he is didn't work. And then there's a thousand reasons. And putting it on Brian is a huge uh, simplicity. So uh, I, that to me is interesting, and that makes it a, a a right a compelling story. And the fact that again, my 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 enormously talented cousin that she recognized that like you want to learn about Hollywood certainly vaguely modern Hollywood. We may have entered another era now, but post studio Hollywood and how things, how things are done. You can learn it in bonfire. I mean, you can learn it in devil's candy about bonfire. That's the, it's the book to read. It is the, it is the best Hollywood book I've ever read. And I've read uh, now a lot of them. So the opportunity to tell that story with the, with the creator of that story, uh, that seemed like a, Again, it was a no-brainer. It's not what we set out to do, but then the opportunity presented itself and we, we, we seized it. And also just to follow up on what Ben said, Jim, I think part of it is, you know, I think people always think there's some grand plan to things, you know, even with movies. I mean, I was a movie critic and I can't tell you how many times probably I did it as well, but movie critics will say, oh, the director did such and such because of fill in the blank. And then when you're actually watching how or why things happen, it's usually just this whole series of circumstances that fall into place a certain way. So with this, you know, did Ben and TCM think about doing The Devil's Candy as season two? I didn't even think of doing The Devil's Candy as season anything. I was sitting here minding my own business in the middle of a pandemic, and I get this email um, through my website from um, Mad Share at Campside saying, have you ever thought of uh, doing the Devil's Candy as a podcast series, and I thought, no, um, but sure, why not? And that was really how it started. And after I got that note, and they were interested, I literally went with my son to um, Manhattan Mini Storage to go and climbed up this dangerous little ladder and lifted a lot of heavy boxes out and found this box. And I had no idea I had saved those tapes. And I had all me here, I can show you. I have all these, you know, endless folders of type transcript of not only the tapes, but of my notes, because I was so paranoid that I wouldn't let anybody else type them. <laughs> so it was just, you know, and there's boxes of those things. So, but it was just, everything just kind of fell into place. And then Campside approached TCM and they were interested. So it was just this series of, you know, lucky events that's really turned out to be amazing for me. I've never done anything like this and it's been so much fun. Wow, unbelievable. Thank you guys.
Sure. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat from Judy Shields at the Hollywood Times for Ben. How do you feel about doing the podcast as opposed to being on camera? Uh, well, I mean, I love it. I, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I don't want to pretend I, I like being on television. How are you guys doing? Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I would say I like this as well or better. Um, it's just a different, it's, it's real storytelling and it, and, and it enables more of my personality to come out. Um, you know, uh, so I like it. I just, I, I like, you know, I lo- I'm a people person. Um, no, I like collaborating. Um, and I, I'm at my best when I collaborate. Uh, I think a lot of us are, but I'm certain of that about myself. Um, is rarely frustrating for me. Somebody rarely tells me something to do something differently and that I don't bristle sort of when it's creative the way I might, if my, you know, my wife tells me to do something or my eight-year-old who's figured out that she is capable of doing that now. And uh, so I like it. Um, and I like this manner of, of storytelling. I'm really grateful for it. I love radio. I, I, I liked uh, when I, I had a political show that I, did for a while uh, called the young Turks that I started. And, uh, and I, I, when we, <laughs> the guy I started it with Jenk Uger, who's done very well for himself, a good friend of mine. And he, since I left, but he, um, like in, after about three or four years of doing the show, he was like, we're going to put cameras in and we're going to put up all these videos on YouTube. And, uh, and I was like, that's a terrible idea. No one will watch videos of people just talking. Like I wanted, I liked it when it was a radio show. So uh, um, I I don't get how this business works, but I am grateful that uh, podcasting has emerged and that, uh, you know, and it's sort of, again, saluting old radio. And I like this form of storytelling. I'm just much more relaxed. It's a different, you know, you're not putting makeup on, you're not putting a a tie on. And and there's something, you know, as, as, as much as I try and everybody who's good at being on television, who's a broadcaster, and that's the job I think I myself is having. Everybody who does that, it's the moment you start talking into a camera uh, without when you're not really talking to anyone, right? This is different. We're all having a conversation. I mean, there's modern aspects to it. And obviously we're all in our homes and it is a camera, but we're having a conversation. I mean, right now I'm just droning on, but in gen- technically this is a conversation. But as soon as you the lights go on in a studio and there's a camera and you start talking to no one, it is instantly artificial. And then your job is to work backwards as hard as you can to make it as to make it seem as as as, as, to minimize the artificiality of it and to bring some authenticity to it. But this, to me, from start to finish, feels uh, authentic, this manner of storytelling. So I I love both and I have no interest and I'm certainly not giving up the other one, Uh, but I'm, I'm thrilled that we were able to add this. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey uh, with KCLV TV, go ahead. Uh, ben, uh, TCM is also hosting a night dedicated to Brian De Palma, which if you could tell us a little bit about that and will Julie be making appearances throughout the night talking about the latest podcaster? Uh, she came, but we wouldn't let her in the studio. Uh, she was like, let me bang it on the door. No, of course, we're doing it with Julie. It's me and Julie hosting a night of Brian De Palma movies. Uh, we have, uh, we're, do, we're starting with, let me make sure I get them right. We're starting with Bonfire. Um, uh, and which is making its TCM premiere. I think this is the day after the 4th of July. I think this is on July 5th that you can check this out. Uh, so we start with Bonfire and then uh, Obsession, Sisters. Uh, I think those are the only three Julie and I do together, but then we also have Blowout and, uh, and Body Double. So, and, and it's sort of, you know, we see the movies, but mostly it's Julie, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, Brian, talking about what kind of director is, he is, sharing uh, the stories, uh, uh, some of which are in the devil's candy, some of which aren't. And just, again, mostly what, what she, because what's not in the devil's candy, of course, is what has become her her now 30 plus year uh, friendship with uh, with Brian De Palma. So, um, uh, you know, so again, and Obsession and Sisters, uh, Bonfire is a TCM premiere, but, and, and I don't know whether we've shown, I think we've shown both Obsession and Sisters, but they're not, they don't show up regularly on TCM. So they're going to be new to a lot of people and they're both, uh, they're both uh, they're both weird in their wonderful De Palma ness, um, and uh, I think they're you know and they're unquestionably uh, the, uh, worth seeing. Those are they're they're really good. I mean they're weird, but they're very good films, both of them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aurora. Go ahead. 
Um, hi, um, both Jim and Jeffrey took my questions, but I came up with another one. Um, I'm wondering if the other players like uh, Bruce and Tom and Melanie know about this and how they feel about the podcast or the idea of it if they haven't listened to it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I know that TCM reached out to different yeah. people to see if they wanted to participate and uh, none of it, it was interesting. None of the above the line people wanted to participate, but a lot of the other people did. And not to give anything away in subsequent episodes, but what was really remarkable, I did do fresh interviews with a lot of people, um, the first assistant director, the producer, the line producer, um, a lot of the people who worked on the film. And what's fascinating to me is their memory of being on that film is not, oh my God, I worked on that disaster, but oh my God, how much I learned being on that film, how amazing it was to work with Brian, how incredible it was to be on this huge thing, you know, shot on the streets of New York. And, um, and so m most of them, have this remarkably positive feeling about the experience and sadness that it didn't work out. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, let me let me add, and without again spoilers, the uh, many people involved in the movie participated, um, and, and there was we got you know we reached out as we always do. These are incredible. You know, I don't, Tom Hanks is a, a very busy person. Um, uh, he's a professional actor. Um, of some <laughs> success. And, and so we reached out to all these people and, and, and I don't even know what the exact reactions were, but there was no negativity at all. I mean, we, most people, you know, in general, let me give you a little hint into talent booking. Uh, almost everyone says no. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, that's just, you know, uh, so it, it was all very polite and encouragement and, you know, there's not, you know, they're all, none of their representatives, so there was no issue. So uh, um, again, it's not, you know, no, no, the, it, no one, if anyone read Julie's book and they were angry about it, I don't think they were, um, I don't think they read it right. Right. That really, it doesn't come. I don't think there's a, cause I don't think there's a hostile moment in that book or an aggressive moment in that book. So, you know, uh, this is a, this is an interesting story to tell. And, uh, and again, I, you know, still talking about this movie, I guess maybe that's part of the reason maybe some people are like, I, I don't want to talk about this movie, but it doesn't, it hasn't come close to defining the career of anyone involved in it. Thank you. Uh, Cami from the Classic Couple, go ahead. Great, thank you. And um, Julie and Ben, if I can maybe get both of your perspectives on this, but Julie, I, I feel like I'm quoting you back to you, but I wanna get this right. So um, you describe the devil's candy as, and I'm quoting, that impossible, expensive, possibly monumental thing and you questioned that Hollywood, this is back in 1990, of course, that Hollywood would not learn its lesson to scale back. <laughs> um, <laughs> in 1990, you were talking about scaling back. And so I was just wondering if I could get your perspective and then Ben, perhaps your perspective. Here we are 30 years later. Um, do you think that Hollywood still feeds on that devil's candy? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think our whole society does to a certain extent, but what's different now in a very positive way are all these other outlets, you know? I mean, I think there's so many opportunities, uh, both on television, in low budget movies, on your iPhone, <laughs> to, for people to do all kinds of small projects. I think what's sad to me in a way is that it's harder and harder to get the big, budget, old fashioned Hollywood movie. You know, that I think you just don't see that much anymore unless it's, you know, a Marvel, nothing against a Marvel superhero movie, love that. <laughs> but, um, but you know, something that may be, you know, uh, 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 the kind of movie that Bonfire of the Vanities uh, was aspiring to be, you know, something that's, you know, maybe for grownups. <laughs> 
And I, and that to me is sad. And the budgets have definitely not come under control, even though one would think maybe they could be with all this technology at your fingertips. So many things could be so much easier, but that just doesn't seem to happen. And that has to do with salaries and all different kinds of things. I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I, th I yes. The kind of, you know, Bonfire was such a big, what was the budget on Bonfire? What did it end up at, Julie? Like $50 million. It doesn't even seem like that much I know. anymore. Yeah. And Nothing. it was 30 years ago, but still you could even have topped that then. So, but what there isn't anymore, and Julie and I talked about this uh, when she was uh, in Atlanta to, to shoot the night at De Palma movies. I think we did. Um, is that what's what's gone is the middle range movie, right? I mean, we know the Marvel movies and, 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 and Warner Brothers is, is going to have the DC movies. And but what is showing up that, you know, what television has done with what these wonderful shows, right? These great, great shows have done is it's almost like they've filled the void of the grown up adult drama. And and that is uh, wonderful because there's so many of them. And ultimately, it's still sort you know, I mean, you, 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 Game of Thrones was a, those were each, those were 53 minute movies, right? Each week, those were star, Sopranos, right? Those were, those were not, those were not, I didn't feel like episodic television. And now there are all these great shows, but what is missing again is what we're, you know, I, what people I know in the business and I don't know anything about the business, but producer friends say, you know, 10 million, 15, up to 25, $30 million movies, big budget. That's a real budget, right? To make something, but, um, but they're not, 150 million, 200 million, 100 million. So, so there was a the the movie released. God, I guess it was on HBO Max. So I guess it's Warner Brothers. I should probably know since you know it's our company. But uh, and if it's not, I'm sorry. Uh, Those who wish me dead. Yeah. So that was the Angelina Jolie movie, and she's like a jumps out of airplanes to fight fires. And um, uh, what's his name? John Berthal is in that movie, and uh, uh, Aiden Gillen. You know from uh, the wire and game of thrones and i liked that movie and it wasn't really my kind of movie and some of it was unrealistic or whatever but i i felt like oh man this is the kind of movie that came out in the 90s and that's great i'm totally fine with that i think about like the the judge with robert duvall and robert downey jr and i know that was some time ago but i always think like that movie just does like i can't believe it got even made when it did because that movie seems that kind of movie is from a totally different era and now if that happened they, it, and it got they it would be a limited series right you know um, it would be mayor of east town which was phenomenal right but wasn't a movie so uh I, that's too bad that that we look at either a million dollar movies these little independent movies million two people cobble together which could turn out to be great and obviously there are some exceptions but there aren't it's not the budget for the stuff in the middle that's for grown-ups you know, we're obviously catering to a young adult and teenage uh, audience with the big mainstream movies and certainly the movies that catch your eye that have the billboards that get the press attention. So uh, that's that's uh, that's regrettable, but it's not like there is I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use the word content, but it's not like there's not really good storytelling available to see on a screen. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, John from The Hollywood Soapbox. Hi, thank you for the follow-up. Um, I'm curious, you know, the book, Tom Wolfe's book is certainly seen as a modern classic and the movie less so. So um, I know that there's a lot of personalities that you documented and that'll come through in the podcast as well. But do you also believe that it, there was sort of an original sin and that you had a book that maybe wasn't uh, perfectly adaptable for a film and that the challenge was gonna be met by any director in any cast? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tom Wolfe said it right from the get-go that he always described his books as the, the series of slices of life, you know? And, you know, interestingly enough, I'm sure that if somebody had been wanting to adapt it today, they would have done it as a limited series for television, which it's probably more suited to because then you could really delve into all those individual characters. What's interesting about Bonfire, the Vanities, the book now, I was actually on some kind of panel a few weeks ago, a podcast where they were talking about the Bonfire, the Vanities. And, you know, that book itself has become a hot potato in a different way now because of all the uh, racial stuff in it that 
just today would be much harder to adapt for all kinds of sensitivities. Even though I think Tom Wolf uh, was doing a satire, I think it would be extremely difficult to adapt today for probably the same reasons that it was difficult to adapt 30 years ago, but with a with a 2021 variation on it. Um, so yeah, I think the book itself was really tough. On the other hand, I think it would make a terrific miniseries, um, you know, with all these great character actors playing those roles. Thank you. Um, Mike from the Video Attic, go ahead. Hi, uh, this question's uh, uh, for Julie. Uh, I was just curious when the last time you saw um, Bonfire of the Vanities and is it kind of strange watching it um, again, uh, just being so close to the production? Well, I saw it again just a couple months ago when we started working on this. I definitely watched it a few times. And yeah, it's always been strange for me to watch because for me, it is like that photo album of my experience on the set. So I kind of think, oh yeah, that's right before I interviewed so-and-so <laughs> or such and such. But having said that, I've always felt that the movies in its own crazy way is a lot of fun. You know, that each, if you take it kind of scene by scene, it's just mind boggling. You know, the thing about Brian De Palma is that he never makes a boring movie. You know, you always know you're gonna see something. So kind of the question that you guys asked uh, before about what do you miss seeing in the movies, the big budget, it's not even so much a question of big movies, but just something that visually kind of knocks your socks off because it's just so interesting and somebody's really having fun concocting ideas of how to create this scene. And you know, in, a, in an interesting way, Brian De Palma and Tom Wolfe were not so different from one another because Tom Wolfe, I mean, if you read his books, these crazy sentences and, you know, <laughs> made up words and, you know, it's wild. And Brian is the same way. I mean, he just wants everything to be interesting. So for me watching the movie, I mean, I could never watch it as a film critic, actually. First of all, I've seen it way too many times and have too many other feelings about it. But to me, it's, um, you know, I just think it's really interesting. And I think that, um, well, well it'll, it'll be something for people to see when it shows on TCM, you know, people will be able to experience it. And I think it will be a surprise for a lot of people. Like, why was this considered such a big disaster? I can name five other movies that came out that year that were 10 times worse. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I exactly agree. It, it's such an interesting um, film. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim from Real Talker. So this is kind of a question for both of you. Um, you know, especially with the, the podcast, The Plot Thickens, you know, in this industry, there's a lot of, in a sense, sometimes pandering. There's not, you know, it's tough to sometimes share your honest opinion. And I feel um, being in your positions, both of you, you too, Julie, as, as a critic, uh, how do you navigate the relationships that you make? Because you often, you know, it's, it's easy to say nice things about a project or an actor, but there's failures too. And how do you navigate the personal relationships you have with these directors and actors in a sense and offer the fair criticism that is, if it's a bad project, bad performance, but yet, you know, not to offend them enough. And, and I'm sure Ben, you can speak about it with what you had with Peter too. Um, how do you approach that? And how receptive are, are they usually um, to criticism or not? Because we know it's like, it's tough sometimes to bring someone on a podcast. You want to see a lot of positive things. You don't want to make it negative in a sense and offend someone. But, but what's the navigation that you guys have learned over the years with some of these very prominent figures, you know, that uh, don't have to do interviews interviews or don't have to talk to certain people. Um, how do you maintain the, the professional aspect and then the personal maybe relationship and friendship and in a sense, keep it fair all the way around, but not be afraid to, to in a sense, offer critique or bring up some uncomfortable moments? Well, I think Ben and I come at this from different positions because um, he has to actually talk to people over and over again at some point. And, and lives in LA, I live in New York. And the truth is while I was a critic, 
I, the only person I really became friends with was Brian. And I actually stopped reviewing his movies after that, after Bonfire of the Vanities, um, not out of malice, but because I felt I couldn't be objective about them. Um, you know, as a film critic at some place like the, you know, at a, at, at a paper like the Wall Street Journal, you're discouraged from actually becoming close to anybody. You know, I wrote profiles of a lot of people, Steven Spielberg, uh, I, you know, major characters in Hollywood and major film executives. I wrote some pretty tough stories and uh, I, I couldn't really be friends with those people, not because I didn't like them, but because it exactly what you're saying, it would cloud your judgment. Um, my friendship with Brian is a rare thing. It's happened to me once. And, um, uh, and even with the book, there were many times when I was writing the book that, that, that I just had to zone out my personal feelings to tell the truth, but I also tried not to be mean, you know, and I'm sure there are people who say, well, you were mean because I described something that they might not like, but I tried not to be gratuitously, you know, just snide or something like that. But, you know, I, I did, after, a few years after I wrote this book, I stopped being a critic for exactly the reason you're talking about. Not even exactly that reason. It was really more like having written a book myself and I've subsequently written many books, I've experienced what it's like to work so hard on something to do such a good job um, or you think you have. And a lot of people will respond positively, but there's always people who don't. I'm sure when our podcasts come out, there will be people who say, you know, who don't have a good reaction to it. And part of what I tell myself is, well, just take it like a woman because you used to do the same thing. Um, but it does complicate relationships. And I, I wonder what it's like for Ben because he lives right there. So well, I was a critic for a while and I didn't even like the term and I wasn't yeah. very, I wasn't very good at it to be honest, I did the Ebert and, and Cisco and Ebert show for, for a year and, you know, very publicly lost that job, which was humbling and embarrassing and all the reasons that you would think it would be embarrassing to sort of have, you know, it be news when you get, at least in the movie world, it's not good, it wasn't big news, but it was, you know, in the movie world to sort of fail publicly. So that's one reason why I'm interested in failure. I failed publicly. And, um, uh, but I, you know, uh, so uh, some some of my best friends are critics um and that's true i did a show i mean i worked with uh, matt atchity and and lonzo duraldi christy lemire was the ap film critic for 13 years and works for the ebert website now and still does the, their shows now called a breakfast all day that i used to be on under a different name and what the flick was what we, when we did it but i those guys are great and they have what they say i learned something every time i listen to one of their reviews every time i sat down with them but it was hard for me to criticize somebody else's art that I watched for two hours and then thought about for 13 minutes before going into review sometime. And I would tell people officially that I know I was very sober and I wrote and thought it out. But sometimes, you know, whatever, you get busy, you're doing three or four movies in a day. And, and to be flipping about something that people worked really hard on, just it didn't sit well with me. Uh, personally, I wasn't good at it. And, and I... It, it, you know, I, I could take a shot at like there were very few directors who I felt I was like Michael Bay. He doesn't care. And he's a billionaire and he knows his movies are like super loud. Right. You know, and he's fine. Like I I could. But like short of that, it was hard for me. And and then with TCM, with like, you know, wanting to get these people to come in and talk about some of their work on the air or getting them to come in and talk about other people's work. Right. You know, I mean, to get, you know, George Lucas to come in and talk about how he was influenced by Westerns. Like, I don't want to criticize George Lucas. Like, and, you know, and I don't know if that makes me weak or, you know, but, but I'll say this, that I went to, uh, so I went to Columbia Journalism School and because I was a, a journalist for the first basically 10 years of my career. And we had a guy, some of you, you may know, because he works for NPR now. I, I still think he does. He was at the time that was the Supreme Court reporter for the Baltimore Sun. He covered the Supreme Court for like 58 years, Lyle Denniston. And he came in and talked to us like in the first month 
at Columbia. And he said, look, man, I cover the Supreme Court. Um, so I, I, I know these justices to call them, right? And uh, when I need to, and to call their clerks when I need to. And sometimes they give me uh, important information. He goes, but I, uh, he goes, I went to one thing. Some Sunday he went and people were playing tennis and they schmoozed and they drank. This was like, you know, in 1965, he's talking to us and like whatever it was, 1992. And I, I'm, I'm telling his story slightly incorrectly, but the gist of it was, he was like, I totally see the problem. I can never do this again. I can't be friends with these people. I can't go play tennis. He goes, a lot of reporters do. They get information. He goes, I'm not even knocking them. He's saying, I cannot do it. Yeah. So that's it. And, and I think that's true. And Julie expressed exactly why it's true, why she stopped reviewing Brian movies, right? She likes him too much. And, and I, so I don't care. I, 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 my, I like artists, man. I like talking to them. I like talking to them about their business. Um, and I think they're interesting. I like living out here. I think there's so many smart, creative people here. I love defending LA because I, but I, I'm not going to turn around then and talk about why you shouldn't go see the thing that they spent sometimes like six and a half years making in some capacity, right? From so because I'm like, hey, that, yeah, that sucked. That script was stupid. Like, I don't know, man. I, I know I'm, I'm now I'm making fun of critics and I don't mean to because there's huge value in it. Like the first time somebody uh, sketched out a, a drawing on the wall of a cave, right? He was like, look at what I've created, right? And then a couple of people walked by and was like, that sucks, right? You know, and I'm like, hey, look, there's criticism. So art criticism is valid. It's vital. It's necessary. I'm not good at it. And I'm going to leave it to other people. Thank you for the transparency. Really appreciate it from both of you. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey from KCLV, you're up next. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, Ben, I just want to say how much I loved you and your brother, uh, Josh, when you were doing all the courtroom stuff. I never missed it. So have him back soon. That was just one of the best series. Oh, thanks. We'd love to. You know, that'd be great to do that uh, every couple of years. Just something, something dateliney. Thank you. I'll tell him. And don't, don't feel too rejected about Cisco and Ebert because I have my letter from the producer's rejection when I wanted to be a guest critic, I wrote to them. So this is my 26th year as a film critic. And I had those problems too, not so much about trashing a film, but personal questions. I don't ask personal questions like a lot of entertainment reporters do. So that's always difficulty when publicists are saying, don't ask about the relationship. Of course not, that's not nothing like that. So yeah. now I know, I know that it's a little bit off uh, in the distance, but can you give us a little tease about the Lucy podcast? Cause I'm a huge Lucy fan. Are you going to concentrate on her movie career or just can you just give us a little preview? Because that's exciting too. Yeah. Yeah. So we're working on these things uh, simultaneously. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think it's going to be great. Um, uh, I just uh, uh, put my voice down uh, for episode one last night. We, we're not, we don't do them in order. You know, it's it, what's what, what most people, I mean, I guess you guys would know. I don't know. I, I didn't even know the uh, Julie may not have known. Now she knows like, you don't just think, all right, so how should we tell the story? I will right, we'll do this one. We'll talk at the beginning. Like, man, these, you know, every episode is, is the entire series is mapped out. Every episode is, is mapped out very carefully, you know, you, uh, different writers, different producers are assigned to different episodes to get them done at different times. It's a, it is a, uh, it, is, it is a dance. Um, and so that part has been, has blown me away a little bit. I mean, it, this is a, a, a collaborative artistic endeavor. Uh, every podcast you like, every single podcast you like, you have given too much credit to the host, not enough credit to the producer, and not nearly enough credit to the person really responsible for you liking it, the audio engineer, the sound engineer. Yes. But what these guys can do to tell stories, it's amazing. And I, I, I should have known, I mean, I, I, when I was in news, obviously I worked with editors. I gotta tell you, I spent, it's not on my resume, it never has been, I've never, I don't talk about it much. Um, I spent the, what was I there? I was there from like almost nine months, including six months on the air at the beginning of TMZ, the TV show. TCM let me do it. None of us really knew what it was. I didn't know TMZ, the website. I did it for a friend, a former managing editor of mine in Miami, Bryn Friedman, it was her fault. And she was like, no, this is going to be like the daily show, but about entertainment. Blah, blah. She was wrong. Anyway, she got fired, which is a great badge of honor for her before I started. And, and I didn't like that time of my life, although I came away impressed both with uh, some, Harvey Levin, who was, I've he was like Walter Cronkite. I mean, he was involved in every aspect of the show. 
like and that was impressive to me and these were good mostly good people but we'd have like 22 seconds of material of somebody coming out of a garage who i'd never heard of talking about a show i'd never seen and it'd be the you know and then i would be like i have to do a two minutes on this or a minute 40 and those audio editors man they are editors not just they weren't audio editors but they were editors but the way they would play with audio they would turn these because you know that show is engaging right and it was really engaging from the start um it wasn't about anything that i care about but and i quit which was the greatest thing and they were they were they let me leave walk out on a contract so god bless them i'm not knocking them but what those editors could do was amazing they would turn nothing into something and we never give enough credit to it in movies and certainly in podcasts, because of course, you know, there's nothing, there's no visual component to it. So, you know, uh, they really make things sing. Like sometimes I'll be going through a script and I'll be like, well, this can't work. And our, 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 uh, sort of the, our director, our executive producer of the podcast, Angela Caron, be like, it's going to be fine. Wait till, wait till Mike Volgaris gets a hold of it. Wait till he edits this, wait till he puts it together. And inevitably you're like, oh, wow, that was impressive. So uh, they're the, they're the stars. And I'm not just trying to be a guy who sort of calls out somebody below the line. They shouldn't be below the line. They really are in many, in, in nearly every way, other than the subject, uh, the, the most important person, the most important artist involved in the, in, in podcasts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mike from the video attic, go ahead. Hi, yes, this, this question's uh, for both uh, Julie and Ben. What's your personal favorite uh, Brian De Palma film? Oh, oh I, have, I have three favorites. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I take, let me divide them by category. I'd say my favorite crowd pleaser film is, I mean, The Untouchables is just fun. And I love the dying scene of uh, Sean Connery. It's just amazing. Um, but I love Blowout. I think of his thrillers, it's by far my favorite and I love all of them, but that one, I just, I think it's an incredible movie and I appreciate it. Actually, that was something I appreciated even more after I did The Devil's Candy because when I got to see the sound guy operating, it really elevated that work of the sound engineer. So I thought that was amazing. And also to see John Travolta in that role was, was um, incredible. and. You know, uh, it's hard to say as favorite movie, but I thought his most powerfully emotional movie was Casualties of War. I mean, it's just an incredible war epic. And it's a movie that, you know, is so hard to watch because it's so painful, but it is for something that is such a painful movie is stunningly beautiful. Um, and, you know, really good but there's a lot of other ones I like I'm a fan I love his movies I think they're great but those three I think are really really uh, oh my god and Scarface <laughs> which I mainly love because I started watching it with my my son who's eight when he was eight which is completely inappropriate but <laughs> Brian actually gave him a poster signed to oh, Eli man. And, you know, we have so much Scarface paraphernalia around our house. It's embarrassing. That's great. Um, uh, uh, Julie is named, uh, it'll seem like I'm just copping out, but it, I'm not. And I've thought about this since we've started doing this, but uh, I love Blowout, always have. Um, uh, you know, saw in a theater, remember seeing it in a theater and thinking that was cool. Those were cool people. And some, uh, and, uh, and it didn't seem like other movies it felt very European. Um, that sounded arrogant, but I meant that in a cool way. Right. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, I love the untouchables. I mean, I, I'm a, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Costner fan. I'm a Connery fan. It was, they were, you know, they were so good. They were perfect. And, uh, uh, and, so the untouchables is great. And then uh, I, uh, uh, and I, I agree to a hundred percent on casualties of war. Casualties of war is great, great film. And for, you know, it was a personal film for Brian, emotional film for an Omega, you know, and part, but it's part of the story of bonfire, right. Coming out of casualties of war. That's sort of if casualties of war had gone differently, he might not have made bonfire. Um, that fair to say, Julie, right. Yeah. Very yeah. fair. Um, uh, 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 and uh, you know, I haven't seen it. I, I probably, I may have only seen it start to finish twice. I saw it when it came out when I was definitely too young for it, but it was great. 
um, and then saw it again and still liked it. I don't know whether it would hold up. It probably wouldn't. I know there would be some problematic aspects to it, but I, 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 I love Dress to Kill and there are still yeah. moments in it that I, that are, you know, there are scenes and this is the sign of a great director. I mean, there's three scenes in Dress to Kill that I just, I know, I see them, I can imagine them in my head. Uh, and that's Brian, right? That's, that's Brian creating those shots. And uh, I'm biased because um, I, I don't just, I mean, it's like a crazy crush uh, on Angie, who's Angie Dickinson, who's <laughs> so, I mean, and I cru- it was a crush before I knew her. Now it's legit. I, I could, it just, it's impossible not to love Angie Dickinson. It can't be done. Uh, and I think she's a super underappreciated actress. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, but I, so I, I would, I would have a group of four that would include the, those three and, and dress to kill. But as you said, I mean, I'm, what, I, I'm not, anytime you make one of these lists, I'm like, I don't mean to diss Scarface. Right? I like Scarface, <laughs> right. You know, I like Carlito's way. Um, Anyway, so uh, I, uh, um, I carry for crying out loud, right? And and the ones we have, sisters, obsession. These are uh, these are fun movies. Uh, he, well, well, you know, he's a, he's a terrific, he's a defining filmmaker of the defining modern era of American films, American movie making. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And final question of the day goes to Cami at the Classic Couple. Thanks so much. So just circling us right on back to Bonfire, um, Julie. I wanted to. Uh, ask you, of course, you had unprecedented access, right, as a, as a, um, as an author and an observer. And if you can think back, what do you think was the most surprising thing you discovered about Hollywood filmmaking um, in this process? I think the most surprising thing was the I'm going to use the word chaos, but not not in terms of it being a mess, but just it, it's almost deliberate chaos. There's so many things, especially for a movie like that, that's so big. There's just so many different things. It's like a corporation in a way, um, you know, or I think Spielberg or, you know, it, p- people used to talk about the factory of the studio, but this is different because this is sort of like a conglomeration of all these things going on simultaneously. And just thinking about what the director has to hold in his or her head while they're making this film. I mean, it's hard, it was hard enough for me to write, you know, it's hard enough to write a book to keep all the different pieces in, but here it's all these people and places and the three dimensionality of it, you know, just the, the the organizational part was something I just never thought of. You know, you're moving tons of people and equipment and stuff. There's construction. There's all these different aspects to it. And yeah, I guess at some level I must have known that, but to actually be there, I think that was just a constant astonishment. So, you know, the fact that any movie ever gets made is a miracle. And the fact that some of them are actually good is even more of a miracle. Totally. But, but let me just say quickly to all anybody, you guys out there and, and anybody who loves movies on the off chance and just odds are at least one of you hasn't read the devil's candy. Uh, you'll love it. Like it's just so good because no matter how much you think, you know, about movie making, it will, it will change how you think about it. Right. I mean, it changed Julie. She watched it and she was like, Oh my God, I had no idea they did this. She was a film critic for the freaking wall street journal. Right. And she didn't know. Right. You can't know. That's the beauty. That's why that's why the devil's candy. The book is so valuable because it just teaches you so much about this business, this weird. And of course, it's a catastrophe in a sense, because it's this 50 million dollars of business money, of corporate money invested in a bunch of lunatic artists like Brian De Palma. Right. Of course, if their potential for conflict is enormous. I mean, it, so which is why we're doing the podcast, which is why she wrote the book. Right. Because it's it's these forces coming together that, you know, they're oil and water in many ways. They don't belong together. Um, but, you know, when it works, it's amazing. Right. And uh, and when it doesn't work, you can learn from it. And there are parts of it that are still amazing. Again, there's value. You know, I like seeing movies that that don't work. Right. Sometimes it's fun. It's interesting. So anyway, that's uh, so whatever you're doing, man, if you or if it's been more than a, more than 10 years since you've read the book, just read it. Just read it. You'll love it. And you'll it'll help you re fall in love with movies. 
Okay, and I'll put in a plug because of the podcast. The book is my that book came out before there were audio books, so I got commissioned to do an audio version. So talk about like Ben was talk about hard and the necessity of sound engineers. I did the audio version of The Devil's Candy, which has just come out. And it's incredible. It was such an incredible experience because, you know, I'm sitting there, you know, COVID in this booth and there's this sound engineer outside and then the director up on the Zoom screen, you know, and it's, you know, even in that modest little scale, how difficult that is just to, you know, you, the idea is to keep people awake as you're reading this thing. And so, you know, it takes a lot of work to do that. It is really hard to record more than about 30 minutes at a time and not be in your head thinking that this is horrible. Like, and you forget, <laughs> and you forget how to say like, you know, I'll do, I, I spent two hours recording the first Lucy episode last night. And by the end, I was like, next time on the plot thickens no that's horrible next time on the next time on the plot thickens and you're like i can't speak i don't know how do people say this how do people do it so i uh, i haven't done a whole uh, uh, audio book so i just you you lose your your brain stops functioning in a way that it would normally and then you do it 12 times and then the engineer will get it and he'll be like yeah they all sound exactly the same it's fine you know but in your head it's a catastrophe thank you both Thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Ben and Julie, for your time. I will get the audio out to everyone shortly. Um, but in the meantime, enjoy the first two episodes of season two and uh, download on June 29th. <laughs>